short-term offenders come home with a laundry bag, with all their belongings, everything in life that they had for the last 10 or 15 years, that's the only thing they had. They ain't had no family. They ain't had nobody to receive them. The only thing they had was a knit bag with a bunch of pictures and some legal work or um, things, mementos that they saved from the prison. And they have to come out here in the society and make that transition. And no tools or no nobody's here to receive them. There's no help for women coming out of prison. We're pretty much on our own. We're thrown back into the houses of the abuser, of the abuses. We're put back in our old neighborhoods because I certainly was. You know, I was put back in the middle of drugs. Like when they put people on placement, people that don't have anywhere to go and the state has to put them on placement, they're putting them in areas that are drug infested. They're putting them in motels. And you're gonna take a recovering addict that has absolutely no support system and throw them in a crack den? Why? You're setting them up for failure. They really don't have a place to go. So they may get an old girlfriend to say, okay, you can stay here for two weeks. Now an aunt says you can stay here for two weeks. And they're bouncing around and there's no stability. They may be with a sister this week and be with a brother the following week or be with a girlfriend or even sleeping in a hallway. I had a friend that was released that had nowhere to go and um, I didn't have anywhere for her to go either. I mean, I was sleeping on a couch in a church office. I don't have a place to stay. You know, I don't have a stable environment of my own. Like, I could probably go lay on my mother's couch, but who wants to do that? I'm a 40-year-old man. With so many doors shutting and not enough opportunities, then where's that going to leave me? What am I, what am I eventually going to be forced to do? If you don't have a place to live, no matter how much desire you have, that desire gets crushed when, before you can be concerned about a job, you're looking for a place to just have a roof over your head. So if we don't put in place some type of housing and be able to create jobs for them, they are going to go right back. That circle is going to go right back and they're going right back into jail. They can sleep there. They got a bed. They can eat. They won't be hungry. It's better than being on the street. Do you know what the need is? It is horrible. We have to say no majority of the time. Reentry issues and the lack of resources is overwhelming. When you think about barriers and people coming out, most housing is, is private, regular housing, right? And, and the challenges with accessing that are that you're working with individual landlords. It tends to be very expensive. Transportation can be a challenge to get to places. For people with criminal justice backgrounds, they can't access if they have a felony conviction up to a certain amount of time. Often they can't access until a parole uh, violation is complete. You can't access public housing if you have a drug conviction. I'm talking about a guy like myself who I sold drugs for a long time. That's my charge. And with that, in the system, you're not, you're not entitled to any kind of welfare benefits, cash welfare benefits. Um, you're not entitled to any kind of TRA housing. Um, so that puts us at a clear disadvantage. A lot of people are coming home to no family. And if we don't have housing in place for them, they're going to the shelters. The same people that I'm talking to one day in jails are the same people that you're talking to the next day in shelter when they get out. So the effects that happen from institutions like jail onto shelters are that everybody gets sucked into the same type of uh, social issues going on. And this, it tends to be a really combative, unsafe, challenging place to be. They're not supposed to let you or release you from prison unless you have an address. So they're like, all right, we'll put you in the shelter. Did good there for a little while until I came across these two girls that asked me one day, could I get them some heroin? And of course I said yes. Shelters make you leave in the middle, in the morning. You can't come back until 5 p.m. You know, so you're looking at people then that are carrying around everything that they own between the hour, all the daytime hours. Go out and try to find a job if you can't come home after 4 p.m. in the evening, you know, or 5 p.m. in the evening. You, know, you need to do interviews. What if you find a nighttime job? You can't take that or you lose your place to live. So it is a real, it is a real challenge. So the next best thing for them to do is hit the streets. I like being outside. I like knowing that I was safe. My back was against the wall. I could hide, sleep behind a dumpster. I survived on potato chips out in the street and Kool-Aid. People really think that I chose that life. You know, they're like, well, you don't have to be out here. You could go home anytime. But I couldn't. I couldn't. I didn't know how to stop doing drugs.
Transitional programs usually has a time limit. It's funded by somebody that says, you can have six months, 12 months, 18 months to work on getting somebody to the point where they can survive on their own. This program is an 18 month residential program. We want an individual to be able to leave prison, be able to come to a place that they can call home. Our clients have their own bedrooms. Um, they have a kitchen, an eating kitchen. Um, they can cook. Um, the, from 9 to 5, they're not allowed in the building. They are either at LIFAs um, in the workshops that we have there, and those are the job training skill workshops, the entrepreneurship workshops, computer um, programs, the literacy programs, one-on-one um, -on -one counseling. A lot of the problems that they're facing now is the drug, the drug use, the drug abuse. Addiction is a, is a chronic recurring disease like hypertension and diabetes. So with addiction disease, you have to be very aware every day of your life of people, places, and things, who you talk to, where you go, what your job is. Uh, the treatment isn't a medical treatment. It's a um, kind of a brain treatment. It's a healing environment driven by the very people who are supposed to be healed. Transitional programs do a yeoman share of the work in, in reentry. Uh, they take a lot of people in that have nowhere to go, and they save a lot of lives. The, what we see really evolving is that, you know what, maybe the solution isn't transitional programming for people. It's for people that need housing. It's to create housing and put services in place to help them keep and maintain their stability, right? So what you start to see is a growth of reentry, permanent supportive housing, which I think really is the wave of the future. It's not lavish or luxurious, but you know, it's an efficiency apartment. It's a place that has its own bathroom and a little kitchenette. It starts to look more like, you know what, I live in the community. If it's a 100% purpose building, so you say this entire unit is for this, you just take off the arbitrary time limits and you say, you know what, people get better and they move through programs as they get better and they move through programs instead of six months, 12 months. That gives you the flexibility to try and program people to help them move on, give them the same employment support services and the same uh, treatment services they might need, mental health access, all those kind of special needs that people have in their lives. That is the way we're moving, is that permanent supportive housing can do this. It works. Now I have keys to a an apartment building, and I can put on my TV, I can play in my bed, I can go in my refrigerator. Housing becomes very difficult because of financing, of course. So you're looking at counties, you're looking at cities, you're looking at leaders from mayor's offices to state governors and from mental health agencies, churches, which have for years been doing this work without anybody's assistance. We have to marry in the probation department, the drug courts, the parole. Everybody's part of the family. If a guy doesn't have an opportunity to, to have somewhere to live, then what do you want him to do? He's going to be stealing. He's going to be breaking in your house. He's going to be trying to sell drugs on your corner. He's going to be trying to eat. And he's going to have no other opportunities. What are you going to do? So you have to look at that. You have to try to give them something. These programs don't just improve uh, public health. They improve public safety. You know, they reduce recidivism. They uh, keep new crimes on the, on the decrease. They really help people reintegrate, build communities, start to pay taxes. We should have the tools and there should be programs available for them to get the help that they need to reintegrate back into society so they can become productive. If you do that, you can really start to focus on the people with the highest needs. You can take them out of these systems. You can save public dollars. You can reinvest that then into housing. When people band together, they can have a safe and warm and comfortable, clean place to eat, to grow, to develop, so you can help each other make that transition. Get them housing. Get them a job. Get income in their pocket. Change the way they think and then give them hope for a future.